Hi, I'm Noah Baumbach. I'm the writer and director of Marriage Story, and today we're doing a one-scene breakdown of the courtroom scene from the movie. Nora, I have to say that your account of this marriage takes place in an alternate reality. <laughs> By suddenly moving to L.A. and insisting on an L.A. residence, Nicole is withholding Henry. Counsel, please Alienating him from his father, which has turned Charlie's world upside down. A scene that's mentioned a lot to me about the movie is the scene actually that comes after this, which is the scene where Charlie and Nicole end up having a fight in Charlie's apartment. And I've done many discussions and breakdowns of that scene. But actually, I think that scene really relies on this scene because this scene is where the, the lawyers sort of take control of the situation and Charlie and Nicole both, in essence, lose their voices. They've hired these people to speak for them and it starts to go beyond where anyone could have imagined. They're voiceless even though they're being given voice, which is was an irony in the this scene. This is the principal reason people came to the theater. Well, that may have been true 10 years ago. Because Charlie and Nicole are largely silent in this sequence, I deliberately didn't put in a lot of direction for their characters. I tried to keep it very spare, so like, you know, that the things, it's a lot of just physical, like Nora turns and stares at Charlie, Nora turns to Nicole who shrugs. You know, here we said Charlie looks humiliated. The judge wipes his runny nose and interrupts. So it's a lot of just very physical direction. Uh, and I did that deliberately because I, I don't, I didn't want to push emotion even in the script onto the actors. I wanted them to be present for what was being said and to bring themselves to it, which of course we see that they do in the movie. Nicole is withholding Henry. Counsel, please Alienating be him from his father, which has turned Charlie's world upside down. It Counselor. amounts to an ambush. Withholding, Jay? Just one thing to point out is that's the first time we hear the judge, which is the only time we suggest that there's somebody else in the room with them. Because uh, the experience of watching it is almost as if it's just these people. Chris Garbosio did the sound with me. There's some coughs you hear place like little squeaks of chairs because you know we didn't want to make it so intimate, but we don't see anybody except for them up until this point. Most often, the, the focal length is going to be on the lawyers and you're going to have the protagonists, Charlie and Nicole, are often out of focus in the background, which I do like in these sequences because Laura and Ray are so dominant and also just such powerhouses as actors that you're watching the lawyers, but if you actually think to look or, or do look, there's almost this sort of slightly out of focus expression in the background, which I think in a way is more effective and more moving because it does make you project a lot onto them of what you think they must be feeling or thinking. Actually, when we were rehearsing it, that we had even sort of played around with Nora standing too, but we found that Nora, in a way, was gonna be more powerful staying where she was, and Laura came up with the great taking off her coat, and that's something that came in a costume fitting. We, we, she was like, maybe I could have this coat and I could take it off. So she, in some sense, sort of flexes her power there, whereas Ray kind of needs to stand and point, and his character is more aggressive in that way and more physical in that way. Alienating? All right. Well, those are fighting words, and it's simply false and does nothing to further this settlement. Your recap of this situation is outrageous. And although California is without doubt a no-fault state, it bears mentioning in the accurate recap of this situation that Charlie had had extramarital affairs. An extramarital affair. Actually, a movie that we looked at as reference for this sequence was Dr. Strangelove, the Stanley Kubrick movie, partly because you have so many people at tables in that movie. There's all that stuff in the war room. And going into this movie, we knew we were going to have a lot of scenes of people in either mediation, conference rooms, courtroom. And that movie obviously has a different tone, but it, it is both absurdist comedy and horror at the same time. And I feel like what these low angle shots have that we did our versions of, if it's, you know, Ray Liotta, there is a kind of both, I think, an absurdity and also a menace to it. And here with Charlie or with Nicole, I think there's more pathos in it because you really feel them sort of at the mercy of obviously the situation, but, but also these rooms, you know, this room has no windows, those lights, the asbestos probably up there on the top of that ceiling. It's just so impersonal. And so, you know, again, one way of describing the sequence is intimate, but it's also so unintimate at the same time. 
do you really want me to go there? Also, this scene posed a challenge, both in the writing and the directing, because I feel like we've seen so many courtroom scenes. I wanted to figure out a new way of shooting a court and really place it in the experience of both Charlie and Nicole. So Robbie, the DP, and I, what we did is we always had the, the camera was always going down the table both directions, which always keeps you both in Charlie and Nicole's perspective always, which is something that's true in the whole movie. but. Um, it's maybe more notable in this scene because you don't see anyone behind them, you don't see the judge until the end of the sequence, and it's people in a row, so they're all facing outward. It's almost proscenium-like, which also spoke to sort of themes or performance that are part of this movie. They come from a theater background, and in this case, it's the lawyers performing, in a sense. But there is this sort of, sort of formalized way where everybody's standing looking forward, but they're all talking down the table. So by flattening the space, it, it actually puts Charlie and Nicole closer together in a sense, even when they're far apart. And I, I wanted to connect them always so that you really do feel this connection, you know, even though everything in the space between them is designed to break this connection. It was something we always talked about, that this sort of presence of love is, is in every scene, you know, no matter what. And in this case, I think it is more, it does have humor in it for sure. You also have these like, take out coffee cups and the water cups, just sort of all the transitional rooms where there are all these people just doing their jobs, but for you, for Charlie and Nicole, it's their lives. So even having like just these coffee cups that are gonna make a journey through this room and then just be thrown out on the way out, I find something touching about that. Yeah, let's go there. Okay. Nicole has admitted to hacking Charlie's computer and reading his emails, which if proven is a felony. And Nora, I don't think you'll be too happy if I ask Nicole about her alcohol consumption. We shot the movie in 166, which is a slightly narrower on the sides aspect ratio. When we were testing the movie, it really was shots like this that led us to that decision because I find it frames the faces just beautifully. And this is a shot that is not dissimilar to shots that we've seen previously in the movie where Charlie is you know, out of focus in the background and, you know, Nicole is, is in focus or vice versa. You feel Charlie there, even though he's really just a blur, or even just his hands there, you know. But this is also something, I mean, without these two actors, these shots are kind of meaningless. You have, I mean, just how much they convey and express silently. I think it's really beautiful. And this framing is not new at this point in the movie too, because even in earlier sequences, even when it's just Charlie and Nicole in a room, we've often lined them up in profile. One of the opening scenes in the movie when they come home and relieve the babysitter and there's early tension between them. They're standing quite far apart from each other while they're having a conversation and we shoot very deliberately through her face to him and his face to her. Of course, then at times we go very close on them. In a way, I feel like we almost go like inside them. I mean, it was like we get so close that you can really project into what they're thinking. Her alcohol consumption in the evenings. What? She confided in Charlie one night recently, having just carried Henry to bed, that she was having trouble standing while walking down the staircase. And from what I understand... I actually generally don't like rack focusing because it's, I don't know, I feel like it's used so literally. There was something about this scene that I felt almost pushed us to the point that we had to do this. That because of, you know, the previous shot we were looking at where this sort of notion of connection, even if one person's out of focus in the background, on one hand, you're so with Scarlett and her interiority, but again, Adam is sort of just suggested in the background. And then here we go and we kind of match it with Adam's interiority and you just see the feeling and the, the depth of feeling on his face. It is one of those things where sometimes I feel like a movie pushes you and challenges you to change style. The emotionality of the movie frees something up technically, that we're able to do something that we weren't able to do previously. And that's what happens here. It's gotten to a certain point in this scene where I felt like I want to see her and in, in connection with him. And I want them both in focus, but we can't keep them both in focus unless, of course, we did a split diopter, which we're not going to do. It's almost like the camera is trying to keep them both in focus, but can't. Like, we're technical and emotional meet. The rack focus I always liked from another movie is in The Graduate when Elaine discovers that her mother and Benjamin have been together. She turns around and we rack focus to Anne Bancroft and then she turns back around and she's in the foreground. It doesn't re-rack yet. 
so she's out of focus, but we know and can project what her reaction is now discovering that her mother has been in a relationship with her boyfriend. And so when it does catch up to her, it's, it's more moving, it's very emotional. The rack we did is not, doesn't imitate that, but the, you know, the earlier sequences, again, of, of projecting onto the person you can't quite see. We're having this moment between the two of them. It's, it's quite intimate, or at least our observation of it is. But meanwhile, all this crap is going on in the middle. They're still talking. You see even their hands, like Ray's hand and Laura's hand, that they're, they're all still going at it and saying stuff. And we have this sort of silent moment that is, isn't even really between them. It's, it's, it's our connect, connecting them. It's not them being connected themselves. This is not an isolated event. So you let me know, Nora. We'll go there as needed. Charlie? Can I ask you, how do you expect to have more time with Henry when you don't exercise the time you already have? We've seen previously in the movie all the sort of everyday events of these people's lives that are now being used as sort of weapons by the lawyers in this scene. Things earlier in the script where they're trying to put the car seat into the car or Nicole confesses to maybe have had a little too much wine because she was nervous before she had to serve Charlie. And I watch both like court procedurals and also thrillers. I watched a lot of Hitchcock movies just because I wanted to see sort of how things are layered in, things that are going to come back later. And so like on page 51, when N Nicole and Charlie are walking down the stairs, they both head down the stairs. Nicole sways for a second and clutches a banister. Charlie takes her arm. Sorry, I drank too much wine. We shot it very particularly and you know, you see her foot go down because I, I wanted it unconsciously to be something that would stay in the audience's you know, memory because it's going to come back later in the courtroom that she drank too much is going to become, again, weaponized. Whereas at this point, this is, you know, two human beings, you know, just having regular conversation. He's totally understanding. He says, I can imagine stressful time. And but then later it becomes this other thing. Oh, wait, no, it's not in. What's not in? The seat's not connected. The other thing that's mentioned where Charlie now has come back out to LA and he's got a rental car and Nicole discovers that the seat's not connected and you know Charlie leans in, the car seat isn't connected to anything. Charlie and Nicole both crouch closely together in the back seat, share a small laugh. <laughs> it's just two human beings talking. It's not, there's nothing extreme or uh, it, we all can understand what happened there and they're fixing the problem, but it's going to become something later that the lawyers use and again that they weaponize in, in this negotiation. Just sitting in the back you seat. You have to buckle in the car seat. It's I know the that. Law. I thought the car rental place. No, they can't do it. It's I know that ability. now. Once we discovered that, we fixed it. Counsel, I'm fairly certain you haven't exhausted in good faith the arguments in the case of this child. In the meantime, we'll keep the status quo. This remains an L.A. family for the time being. So I'm going to appoint an ex- We go from the judge to the judge. It's a strange cut, but I feel like it connects them more than if we did it more elegantly. It's all about their perspective, you know, and it's in the opening sequence with the mediator as well, played by Robert Smigel. For it to really work, you both have. You're cutting on the same person. It's a very strange way of cutting. So we're over Adam's shoulder here to the judge, and there was a subplot that the judge had a cold, which I'll just point that out. Those are as a tissue box. And then we go over Nicole's shoulder. In a sense, it almost looks like a mistake. Now we're over her shoulder to the judge. So we're going from the judge to the judge. So we're just staying on him. There's the tissues again. And there are his used tissues again, subplot. It really aligned them, it keeps it always, it keeps telling that story of Charlie and Nicole and keeping it in, in their perspective, that they're seeing the same thing at the same time. And so much of the story, both visually in the writing, but also very much visually, was designed to always remain in one or both of their perspectives.